computer sure, you were every yeah. day. Yeah, pretty much. It's comfy. Ooh, we are all hooked up over on YouTube. So we're going right. to get the show started in A, B, What's up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are coming to you from a couple of different places on the internet. We're live on Crowdcast, live on YouTube, also okay. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, the app of your choice. You're listening to that podcast later. That's not live, but it's still very cool. Uh, now, Pete, I know you're a little thrown by this, but our theme song, as you know, starts off with one, two, three, right? And it right. always bothers you that I count down three, two, and then do a pause. Right. Before we start, which is And like then very... the song starts, and then it also counts one, two, three, which drives me insane. There's mm-hmm. too much. So this time I did A, B. I thought that would be different. What did you think about that? Is that something I should keep with? Did you feel more comfortable? Yeah, I felt like we were doing trivia. It gave me the A, B, C option. You know what I mean? Ooh, a little trivia hit. Uh, Something (laughs) Pete could speak to. That was weird and insane. uh, And a little, it's like if the Wizard of Oz was like, don't look behind the curtain. There's nothing there. (laughs) There's just a weird numbering system behind this, Oz. As Kevin brings up, maybe it should be CB pause. That's true. And that also stands for comic book. So the implication is maybe I'm going to go for CBC. But, you know, we'll, we'll play around with it. Maybe next week it'll be triangle, circle. And then the oh, pause yeah. is square. Let's Montessori the shit out of this. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I want to learn something. Rhombus. Is this a guessing game? Is this trivia? I'm lost. So am I, but I'm not lost with the fact that we have two amazing guests yeah, for we do. you on the show this week. Later on in the show, Eric Powell is going to be Woo-hoo! here to talk about his new book. But right now, we're going to welcome in our first guest, who is Trung Li Wen. He is the author and creator of The Maggot Shoot Fish. Out now from Penguin or Random House. Trung, welcome to the show. Hello. Welcome. Your introduction oh was like the uh, most hype I have ever like I've ever been for like getting on a podcast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's that's awesome. That's nice to hear. We, we got to keep it fresh. We do a lot of podcasts, so we have to uh, re sort of ignite the fire. Exactly. Uh, so, Trung, let's talk about this book. Um, one of the things that I loved about it is how many different time periods and story periods, I guess you can call it, that you're balancing throughout uh, the span of the book. And you do it very deftly and evenly throughout, which is really fascinating in terms of structure. So I want to talk about all that in a second. But first, before we get into that, uh, I think people could intuit that there's at least a little bit of the story of the magic fish in here. There's a couple of other fairy tales. But where where did the book start? Did it start with, okay, I want to tell some stories of some fairy tales in my own way? Or did it start, I want to tell the story of this family and then the fairy tales worked in? Or did it all come at the same time? It started with the fairy tales first, honestly, because uh, I had always wanted to kind of bring classic fairy tales into an an accessible sort of comic book format. And I'm a big evangelizer of the comic book format and the way that it accesses people's, you know, visual literacy and it gets people really excited and it's a really intuitive format. And I do my best to talk to teachers and librarians about it. And so I've always wanted to tell fairy tales in this particular format. That's really special to me. Um, And when I got the, um, when I got accept, like the, the pitch got accepted and I was like, okay, I don't know when I'm going to get another opportunity like this again. So I'm going to tell as many fairy tales as possible in one project. (laughs) And so I kind of like had to approach it like an essay where I was like, what do all of these stories have in common? Why are they special to me? And how can I make this narrative something that makes sense to a reader as to why all of these specific stories are being threaded together? So that's kind of where it comes from. I mean, again, one of the things that I think is really beautiful about it is how it slowly unfolds over the course of the book, because it does start in this place where, as I was re- as I was reading it, at least, where I was like, oh, it's like a Scheherazade type thing where this mom is telling stories mm-hmm. and maybe you'll have a little bit of a wraparound. But as it gets deeper in these family characters, that really sort of turns to become the main theme, the main driver behind the story, at least emotionally for me. So at what point did that turn and when did you hit? on what would be the emotional turns for both the kid character and the adult character? 
Uh, you know what? I'm never actually totally sure how to answer this question because <laughs> so I read the outline and I organized the story. I knew exactly where everything was meant to go. Um, and I talked about this a little bit, I think, in the back matter, where when things are emotionally difficult for us, we kind of like hold them at arm's length. We intellectualize them a little bit so they don't hit us super hard in the feelings while we're, you know, trying to address them and like kind of practically go through our lives. And so I was doing that while I was creating this comic. I was being very practical. I kind of understood, OK, so the emotional beats go here on paper. And I didn't really realize that it was emotionally like actually affecting me in uh, in like a very personal way <laughs> until I was partly yeah. done drawing the book. So um, yeah, so I think actually like I'd written it, I'd outlined it, I'd scripted the whole thing, I thumbnailed it, it was still like whatever to me. And then as I started drawing it and bringing kind of the narrative elements into it about halfway through the book, I was like, oh, this is important to me emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great way to realize something like that. What, one of the things, I just want to geek out a little bit on it. It is so uh, uh, beautiful. Uh, I love the use of color in this book. The tones kind of uh, uh, really kind of have like, are part of like separate stories. It's 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 clean, but it, it, it bleeds into, like the panels bleed into each other in all the right ways. It, it's one of those things where it's like when you have an artist writer kind of working on a, a, a book, these kind of things really kind of come together in such a magical way to tell a story. I'm just so impressed by how, how well these, these uh, like all kind of work together. Um, did you kind of like, like some of the double spread pages or some of the stuff that like bleeds in each other, was that kind of tough because it's just so magical and beautiful. I couldn't imagine like losing any panels on this book. Yeah, it was really hard for me because this was my first long form project. Like, first of all, I'd never written anything before this. Oh, Literally wow. the last oh, thing I wow. wrote before this book was like a college essay. And then I graduated and then several years went by and I was <laughs> suddenly being a <laughs> So I really, truly had no idea what I was doing. And I had a really strong, like I have a pretty strong sense for how I'd like for stories to evolve visually um, because I'm pretty specific about, okay, like this needs to go here. And I come from like, looking at ephemera like i studied a lot of art history and like the history of advertisement and i'm interested in like the printing press and like how storytelling and pictures and advertising sort of evolved alongside the invention and sort of the innovations around the printing press and mass media and so i'm very into like the history of comics like as it's presented in newspapers and so i kind of come from oh, a wow. place where it's very like like Nell Brinkley is like a person that I really, really enjoy looking into because she was one of the very first kind of like syndicated, like Hearst papers. Like she's going to do like an illustration that's going to be like, uh, it's kind of an early comic book, but not something that we would really recognize as it. Um, and uh -huh. so the notion that storytelling needs to be super specific and very um, kind of compositionally intentional from page to page is something that I sort of like had a good sense for already, but I had to learn while I was doing this project. So it was a lot of experimentation. I had a lot of great support from my editors who were really wonderful at sussing out my thumbnails that were very messy and being like, hey, like this would make more narrative sense in this way. So um, it didn't feel super overwhelming. And I didn't like I was very efficient with the ways that I wanted each panel to um, kind of exist in relationship to one another. But I uh, it it wasn't something that I felt super precious about um, the entire time. Actually, I drew most of the pages kind of like as very individual things where I sort of just sort of guessed mm. what they would look like next to each other. I didn't even understand like what layout needed to look like really. And so it was kind of a, it was sort of a miracle that everything came together so beautifully, <laughs> which I probably shouldn't say because like a lot of people, like my editors and the designer, like everyone worked really hard to make sure that it looked exactly as I intended it to, but it was well, a and it feels learning curve. It feels very intuitive, I think. Um, it feels like you feel sort of the character, like this page, the character sort of is pushing off the pan oh. through the panel because they want to, like it's intentional um, for the character. I wanted to ask you about the sort of rotating monochromatic color palette. Mm -hmm. um, was that something that you were like, I'm gonna do it this way? I mean, similar question to sort of what Pete was asking, but just more specific about that. Or did you sort of find it as you went? Did you go back and like, oh, let me add some red here, uh, let me, let me shake it up like in this panel we're seeing right now. Um, that was actually an invention of my editors because I needed, so I pitched the book as a black and white comic because I like the way oh, black wow. and white stories look. Um, yeah. And mostly Great. because it was, a, it was a limitation of mine because I don't, 
am not very adept at using colors, right? And so I told my editors up front, I was like, hey, like, I know that you want a full color book because that's what your printing capabilities are and that's what sells. I'm not very good at that. How can we do this in a way <laughs> that makes sense to me? And they're like, well, why don't you do a limited palette? And I was like, you could do that. How many limited palettes can I use? And so it became a storytelling tool that was really intentional. Yeah. You can tell what time period something takes place in or what story universe it takes place in based yeah. on the colors. And so the kind of like yellow um, sepia colors are for the past. The present colors are sort of in a like a red heartbeat color. And the blues are sort of like a bedtime story, like blue evening color. And so that's kind of how those palettes came around. I wanted so to cool. get back and talk about the fairy tales for a second, uh, particularly mm -hmm. since you started there. How did you choose the ones that you were going to adapt for this book? I have always been really obsessed with the idea that fairy tales are kind of like people because there are so many different iterations of fairy tales um, that are very similar all across the world in a whole bunch of different cultures. And I was really kind of curious about where that comes from. And I know that kind of like, fairy tale academics and folklorists have sort of decided that it's that it's sort of useless to think about like the origin story like what was the source of this story because they sort of exist everywhere and it's kind of a moot point um and to my mind because the stories are necessarily sort of like immigration stories and stories about transition um fairy tales are kind of a lot like people where they can move from place to place and they'll change the clothes and they'll change their structure depending on what they require to survive in that place. And I've always really loved that, that stories can be remixed and retold and it can be really organic. And so the notion that the content of a story itself, like the bones of it, aren't super important to me because they're going to be quite similar from space to space to space. And there's there are no new stories under the sun, but what matters is the priority and the intention of the storyteller because you learn more about the storyteller than you do anything about the content of the oh. story and it gets back to the notion that storytelling is a connective tissue among people that it's something that's very human and that we use it to connect with each other and fairy tales are such a like beautifully raw um source of evidence for that i think hmm. that's uh, great Late in the book, you introduce this idea, and uh, maybe I got it wrong, but it seems like it's a Vietnamese version of Cinderella. Is that mm -hmm. something, this is pure ignorance on my part, but is that something that does actually exist and there are tweaks and there are differences mm -hmm. in the story? Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, talk about that a little bit. Sure, yeah. So the Vietnamese iteration of Cinderella is not the oldest, but it's related to one of the oldest stories. There's a Chinese story. Um, called Ye Shen, I think. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I don't speak any Chinese languages at all. But, um, but it's a story that I was familiar with as a kid because my parents told it to me and this was the story that I remembered. And so there are a lot of kind of different um, cultural inflections that make its way into Vietnamese fairy tales because like Vietnam as a country has spent a lot of time being occupied by outside forces for literally hundreds of thousands of years. So um, the syncretic nature of it was something that I really wanted to impart into the story. And so aesthetically, it looks very strange because it's about like Vietnam in the 1950s instead of it being like an ancient, ancient fairy tale. Um, but yeah, no, that's a story that I remember like because it was so like it was recognizably a cinderella story but it was also incredibly visceral like i had to the story is very gruesome but i actually had to edit it down a little bit because many more murders <laughs> had taken place in that fairy tale um, but it, was, it had always been one of my favorites and so i wanted to kind of set it down next to a kind of european iteration to get readers to draw their own conclusions about why those priorities shift from place to place and like what different cultures bring to these familiar stories yeah. Uh, this is a question here from the comments from Derek Mainhart. You reference classic newspaper illustration. This reminds me a little of Little Nemo. Was Windsor McKay an influence? Yes, I love Windsor McKay comics. They're really wonderful. Um, there will never be another cartoonist like him, and I cannot even begin to try to keep his style, but I really like love the sort of um, kind of post Art Nouveau, but like early American um advertisement illustration edge that mm. he brings to his work and it's very efficient because he's also a pioneer of animation and so there's a lot of things that Windsor McKay brings to the conversation in comics that I don't think we fully appreciate or talk about all that much so I love that this was brought up in the comments yeah uh not having to do with this project but I believe today you have a story in the Aquaman 80 page spectacular in the sound is that right uh yes. what can you tell us about that um, <laughs> uh, like all of my projects is incredibly nerdy. Um, I love Marguerite <laughs> Bennett. 
work the writer yeah um is incredible and i've loved her work for a long time she was my very first actually like published collaborator and so i have like great um sentiments about making work with her and so um i was like i had a lot of other projects going on but that indie a dc editor reached out to me and was like hey like there's this story that sounds really nice for you and the writer asked for you and i was like who is it and she was like it's marguerite and i was like yes i will make time <laughs> um and she's really great at writing stories that are kind of aesthetically intentional and appropriate for a different artist like she's worked with um, a lot of artists that i really admire and so the tones of her story sort of change and this one she wrote <laughs> um this one was about uh the um about Aquaman and Mira yeah. and uh, their encounter with the Rhine Maidens. And she was so smart in doing this because she was like, oh, you know who's a huge dork about the Rhine Maidens? It's Trung because he knows all about like early 20th century illustration. And he loves <laughs> Arthur Rackham and he loves like the Wagner opera that Arthur Rackham did the illustrations for. I bet he could do something with this. And I sure did. It was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's a great it, fit to yeah. just the two of you as a team together. I think exactly like you're saying, you're your very fairy tale dreamlike illustrations for that and her writing match together very nicely. I love that story specifically. It feels like you're touching the very tip of a giant iceberg of a world. And so many of the stories in big spectacles like that are like, here's a fun little thing where this character finds a friend and yours is like, Nope, we're not doing that. <laughs> uh, it's yes. really cool. Yeah. Is there, I mean, I guess I don't know uh, if this is anything that they look for with these 80 page spectaculars, but certainly with the Aquaman one, it seems like they're kind of setting up things down the road. Is that something that you potentially are following up on with more stories? Um, you know, I really couldn't say for sure. I don't know how the editorial process works very well in Capes Comics. Like because of the way that I work, I had always assumed for my entire career that I would not be appropriate for most superhero comics if i were an editor i'd be like well this guy's work is really nice but like it's not appropriate for every project and so i've <laughs> made peace with that and so the fact that i got to do any dc projects at all is kind of a mind-blowing miracle to me um so yeah. at the moment i i really don't know and i don't know that i would have the capacity to follow up on it because it's a different mode of working that i'm used to but that would be super duper cool if they were to call me and you know hey like do you want to do like this short project um with this writer like yeah it, it sounds cool but i don't know anything about it yeah uh, before we let you go, Magic Fish has been out for a while, and this Aquaman Spectacular, as we mentioned, is out today. But is there anything else you're working on coming up that you want to plug? Uh, oh, let's see. Um, I don't know that anything has been announced yet, but like previously, I did like a Green Lantern short that was only a couple of pages for a Festival of Heroes thing. I did the DC Pride thing with James Tenney in the fourth. We drew it. We did a Batwoman comic together. That was a lot of fun. So there are other things that I have done that are floating around out there. Um, but at the moment, I don't have anything specific to plug. <laughs> no, that's no. all good. Uh, plug good. the Magic Fish, which is awesome, and everybody yeah. should check out. Thank um, you so much for the Magic Fish, man. It is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Thank thanks so much for having me. This was fun. Absolutely. Cool. Have a good night. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, there we go. Once again, the book is called The Magic Fish. It's out now well, from title. Penguin random house and it is very very cool and we are going to bring our next guest into the stream here he is the co-writer and artist of the new book did you hear what eddie Gein done which is out from albatross funny books now with writer harold Schechter, ladies and gentlemen eric powell hello hey, hey. how's it going good and uh, i just wanted to say this on air i know we talked about this before you are moving right now so thank yeah. you for taking oh. the time <laughs> off in the middle of that to come oh, on the show. No we really appreciate it. Uh, so let's talk about this book, which is, uh, pardon me for saying, fucked up uh, in, yeah. in, <laughs> in a great way. But uh, this yeah. is something that I think, like, I knew the name when I read the title. I was like, oh, that sounds familiar. That was some sort of bad guy who did bad things, right? But as it turns out, and as you detail in the book, this is somebody that wasn't just a notorious real-life killer, but somebody who inspired Psycho, Silence of the Labs, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as yeah. you argue at the end of the book, maybe the entire slasher genre is because of this guy. Mm. Where where did the initial idea to be like, great, <laughs> I'm going to go into this darkness and spend yeah. a huge chunk of my time here come from? And was it anything you were trepidatious about at all? Oh yeah. Um, well, the the initial idea came from I was doing a, a book tour for the Goon uh, 20th anniversary, and I was driving through Wisconsin. And uh, I'm a true crime fan, uh, so 
I had uh, uh, I was very aware of of the Ed Game case. Uh, yeah, and uh, as I was driving through this very rural part of Wisconsin, the idea started coming to me of doing a graphic novel based on his isolation in the farmhouse. Um, however, I was very aware of a book by Harold Schechter called Deviant, uh, and Harold is my favorite true crime author, and uh, it's the I guess you'd say quintessential Dean book, you know? Uh, so I was a little, um, uh, a little doubtful about doing it because based on the fact <laughs> that I, I didn't think that I could do anything better than what Harold had already done in Deviant. Um, so the idea kind of, you know, floated out of my head. And then a couple weeks later, uh, it came to me to maybe I could reach out to him, you know, just as on by the chance and see if he might be interested in, in doing a graphic novel, uh, collaborating on one because it had been a few decades since he wrote Deviant. And I thought, you know, maybe he had stumbled upon new information or he had some new perspectives. <coughs> so uh, I found his agent and uh, reached out to him. And much to my surprise, Harold is a huge comics fan. Oh, so nice. he was he was aware wow. of my work, and uh, oh, as he should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, he uh, he leapt at the chance. He was super excited about it, and uh, oh, we that's awesome. we almost started working on it immediately after that. Mm. When why do you think? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, why do you think Ed Gein is um, is not as sort of mainstream recognized as so many other like monsters um, throughout throughout history? I feel like for some reason I, I only know knew about Ed Gein from uh, this random job I was working on that was got into real uh, murder stuff. So I'm just curious um, why you think that would be. Well, I mean, unlike you know Gacy and Ted Bundy and guys like that, he wasn't a. Uh, <coughs> a sexual sadist, you know, that's, and you could say that, I mean, he gets labeled as a serial killer, but by definition, Gein was a necrophile, not a serial killer. Um, I think uh, because of that, maybe he's not, I don't know, and, and he shouldn't be labeled with those same people, but uh, uh, his mental <laughs> illness was a, a completely uh, different, uh, avenue than theirs um but he is pretty well known i mean based on the fact that uh you know uh, he's inspired a lot of fiction for sure i wanted to ask you about the line in depicting things in a book like this because you know when you're doing something like the good there's an emotional cost there of course for the characters but you're still dealing with fiction here you're depicting real people and re real characters and real events so in your mind, where is that line in terms of drawing things in particular, what you can depict or can't depict, if there is one, I guess? Right. Uh, we definitely uh, kept in mind that we were dealing with uh, true events. <coughs> and um, uh, there have been a lot of, um, you know, things done on Ed Gein that were very exploitive. Uh, and from the get go, Harold and I both wanted, didn't want to go down that avenue. We wanted to be, you know, do something, um, that was more suspenseful than, you know, a, a gore fest. Uh, so, you know, I, I, there were definitely moments where I drew a line, you know, and, and didn't, uh, depict, you know, like there's not really any scene where he's you know, butchering anybody or somebody like, or something like that. Um, but you can't get away from the fact that you're dealing with a really horrific subject matter. So, um, you know, you can't really steer away from it. You, you just have to pay attention to how you represent it. Um, speaking of that, I mean, like there, you know, with the goon, first off, we've talked about the goon a couple of times. Huge fan. Uh, unbelievable. Thank you so much for making the goon. 
uh, enjoyed every single issue of it. You are a master. But this is creepy as fuck in a kind of different way than Goon is. Uh, were there kind of things uh, drawing this that kind of like stayed with you longer than you would have liked? Were there panels that you were like, this is too gruesome for this book? I mean, there's some crazy ass shit in this book. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I got I got so deep into the research of it mm -hmm. that uh, it didn't. It was almost um, academic in a way. Okay. You know, if that makes any sense. It was it was like more about depicting things accurately, or at least how I uh, conceived them, uh, conceived the accuracy there. Uh, then, um, you know. Uh, really focusing on um, the 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 gruesomeness of it and also the uh, the history of the of the guy uh, uh, getting into that and kind of you know um, showing where this guy was created and how he was created um, I think for myself, I more got into the aspect of, like I said, from the original concept, the isolation, this guy being alone. And uh, that uh, is what, you know, really shaped him. You know, he, he was uh, mentally abused by, you know, his mother and his father was an abusive drunk. And, uh, you know, and then he's, he grows up with that and then is left completely alone in the middle of nowhere. You know, and uh, it's, you know, just a morbidly fascinating uh, where he went with that. Does it make it easier when you're almost uh, diagramming something that happened in a way as opposed to having it live in your brain, uh, sort of grow out of your brain onto the page? I think so. I think for me, that was that was the case here. Uh, like I worked on a book uh, called Big Man Plans, and that mm -hmm. really it was that's completely fiction and uh it was you know really gruesome violent revenge story um that brought me down worse than this project did like I, like i said it was it, this almost felt academic like i was just right. doing a, a piece of history whereas when i was working on big man plans i was really trying to get into the you know character and stuff and and the story and uh uh it, it brought me down. I was depressed a lot. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry. Well, this <laughs> brings together a couple of the things that we're talking about, but and you've touched on this a little bit already, but definitely reading the first part of the book, or even, honestly, the first <laughs> two-thirds of the book, you feel a lot of sympathy for him. And I think part of that is your skill in terms of depicting sympathetic grotesques is, I think, a fair way of putting mm -hmm. it. Um, was... Uh, again, how do you modulate where there's too much sympathy for somebody like that? Because by the right. end of the book, he's clearly a monster. And you even yeah. have sections where people are talking about doing the very typical, I thought it was a nice, normal guy. And of course, yeah. he has, you know, faces hanging in his great uh, voice. Uh, oh, the great voice. Really <laughs> That's how I hear it. Like, That's how I hear If you need an audiobook, <laughs> I, I'm happy to provide some of the voices, <laughs> whatever you need. That's a lot uh, of different uh, palette you have there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm the bat of a thousand voices. Uh, but uh, getting back to it, how do you modulate the sympathy there? And when do you uh, realize it's time to cut it off? Uh, I just tried to be honest. And I, while I personally, you know, uh, have no sympathy for him because of his crimes, I can have sympathy for him as a human being and what he went through and what turned him into that monster. Um, he was a, he was a monster and he was a, a liar, a calculated liar, uh, and showed, you know, didn't, manifest any kind of remorse for what he had done uh, but he was also childlike and uh and you know he was a calculated liar but he lied like a child you know like he, his lies were very transparent he wasn't a very intelligent person um so yeah i think you can you can condemn the crime and have compassion for the the person hmm. and uh you know 
uh, now that it sounds like you had a pretty good experience doing this in terms of just very calculating, looking through it, are you more interested for your next projects in going to something else true crime? Do you feel like you're going to go back to fiction? Where Where's your head at right now? I have a lot of ideas I want to try to get out. Uh, <laughs> Harold, Harold and I are talking about uh, uh, doing a couple of other projects, um, but I also have some, you know, uh, uh, I, I really, really enjoyed working like this and working in a graphic novel format rather than the floppy comics, um, which I, I'm not going to stop doing comics, but uh, uh, I definitely want to do more graphic novels and there's some stuff, you know, some nonfiction stuff and some fiction that I would really like to, uh, to get to. So I'm going to try my best to, uh, to make those happen. <laughs> now I I'm just curious as, as someone who <clears throat> loves comics as well as graphic novels, is it because if you do a graphic novel, you kind of like control the start and end. Is that why you like it better? Or is it like, with comics, you only get to kind of like mess around for a little bit and then you got to walk away and then come back or. Yeah, you can really, in a graphic novel, you can really stretch your legs. You know, you don't have to go, okay, I'm in like, 22 pages. I have to shoehorn this in there no matter what. Right. Um, and I like, I like short stories. So I don't, I kind of like that. But then at the same time, doing a graphic novel, you have all the room in the world. You know, you dictate the page count. And if you want to do something that is, you know, five pages of a, you know, wide shot panels, you know, or something uh, to really set up, uh, you know, atmosphere and space, um, you have the freedom to do that. Uh, and let me just jump. Let me just say, I, I love how you can really feel that in this book, like the section where you show all the advertisements and uh, oh, yeah, sort of in, yeah. the, in the middle there. Um, yeah. I love that. And I think oh, it's you. such an example of you really taking your time being like, no, I think all this stuff really enhances and it really does the story. Yeah. And, you know, if I had done that in a couple of panels, so, you know, that, that section, it's, it's, you know, the, the very antiseptic fifties ads, you know, the mom, you know, vacuuming or whatever. And then it cuts to the men's magazine ads. And because we were able to take that space and, you know, do four or five pages of those, you know, 50s ads, when you turn that page to the men's magazine ad with the crime and violence on it, it's it's a little bit more striking. Whereas, you know, if you, I was doing that in a regular comic, it would have been a couple of panels and then transitioned over and it wouldn't have the same effect. Well, and not to get too deep into what happens, but, and then a couple pages later, you get just a one panel of like jaw bones. And mm. like, <laughs> I, I, th that then that just punches so hard because we've had this time to really fall into the sensibility here and then you're like you get us with a jab and it just i love it exactly right in the job <laughs> yeah uh we got a question here from derek roger landridge and mike norton recently did a fun arc on the goon any plans on letting other creators play in the gooniverse um possibly yeah um i i have some stuff of my own i need to 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 get out there but uh um if the right uh, circumstances come along and, and someone is free and wants to do the goon uh, or a story in it, then probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have more goon in you or are you done with that at this point? Have you moved on? To yeah, I'm, I'm going to do more goon stuff. We have a, a, an issue coming out. Uh, I don't know, it, my brain is kind of fried right now because of the move, but totally. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have, uh, we have a, uh, uh, another issue uh, coming out relatively soon, I believe. Next, maybe next month, a couple months, something like that. Cool. It's cool. coming sometime. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> let the man move. Let yeah. him move. We will, uh, Eric. We will let you move. We'll let you get back to it. Thank you so much Thank for you. jumping on. Thank you. Oh, Thank you for it's, having me. Oh my gosh, I'm going to so many nightmares. It's, it's tonight. so creepy, but so great and well done, man. Really. Oh, Thank you. Know, you. Magical Thank stuff. You. Thank you. Magical. All right. Have a good night. Bye, Eric. You too, guys. Thank you. Have yeah, a good night. Take care. All right. Magical, hor true crime horror. Well, hor no. I mean, the fact of what he's, you know, the way we're kind of inside this person's head is impressive. You That's know what very I mean? Fun. Like, I agree. It is impressive. The yeah. use of the word magical is just fun. It's like, well, man, like a 
Tinkerbell's magical, and so is this. In a fucked up way, it's very magical it, the way that we're inside the serial killer's mind. Listen, it's yeah. like a wonderful fantasy land where you can finally wear your mother's skin. You know, yeah, it's exactly. like that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, you click yeah. your heels three times together. And you're wearing skin. You're in your skin. Yep, yep. great. Uh, I, I want to shout out Ed Doherty's comment. Um, Ed Gein is a reverse Pete. Wait, he's a nice, normal guy? I thought he was a serial killer, <laughs> which I thought was a nice, a true flip of the intention there. And again, the na name of the book is Did You Hear What Eddie Gein Done? It's from Albatross Funny Books, and it's out now, so definitely check it out. Like I said... Very nightmarish, but very well researched and really yeah, well done. great, beautifully drawn. It's I cool mean, book. the way it just like uh, it starts, it's such a cool setup to have like uh, having Hitchcock kind of talk a little bit about uh, uh, Psycho and his inspiration. It's such a cool like lead into this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wish that Alfred Hitchcock would come over to my house and explain stuff to me, but he can't. But you yeah. know what? You out there all can because it's time for your audience question. Is <laughs> it right. coaster on that one, gang? Let's see. Woo! Spin it and... and see where he lands. <laughs> I got there eventually. On your audience questions, it. here's what you got to do if you're watching on YouTube. Drop a question in the comments. Keep an eye on that. If you're over on Crowdcast, I see a couple of them already, but drop a question and ask a question. But while you all are doing that, we're going to pay the bills a little bit by turning it over to this week's sponsor manscape attention listeners across the galaxy all the way from australia to houston do we have a pube problem so if so our friends at manscape have cleared you for takeoff with our fourth generation and brand new lawnmower 4.0 kick your pubes to the next planet with the performance packs 4.0 the orbits in your pants Feel like you're in zero gravity when you use the best tools for the job for the leaders in male grooming. Join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped and get your rocket ready for takeoff. We go into manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDE at 20. Justin, anything you want to say about the performance package here? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's great. Um, as we know... Uh... Pete as is the real advocate for trimming, and I'm I haven't actually really done it. Pete, convince me you you you've really lived this manscape life. Yeah, and I'm know, on the outskirts. I'll it's, tell you what, not to interrupt or anything, but once things really start to open up again and we can all be together, Pete, maybe you can manscape Justin. Oh my! God. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's uh, how it works, right? <laughs> I want to be manscaped. I want to be friendscaped by my my man Pete. Uh, this is getting weird, but I I do want to say I did use this product. It is very good. The light is extremely handy, and uh, you know you don't worry have, have to worry about any pain. Uh, it's not going to cut you or cause any uh, problems. That, that's how I like my products framed up. You don't have to worry about any pain. No pain. <laughs> Definitely implies the right thing. Sometimes right? they say pain is gain, but in this case, no. You don't yeah. have to worry about it. No, mm. no pain. Yeah. The first uh, Manscaper that I got actually was an ouch brand, like ouch with an exclamation point. They sold it. Oh, yeah. 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 The, ouch, don't trust that one. Lots of pain. Yeah, Extra pain with that one. Yeah. But yeah. Manscaped, no. And in the performance package, you can get a bunch of things. Uh, they gave the Lawnmower 4.0, which Pete was talking about. You also get the weird Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Crop Preserver That's Ball nice. Deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a Travel Bag to Hold your whole solar system, as we always like to say. Mm, Justin, are you said. rocking the briefs still, or what's up? Uh, briefs? I'm wearing, I'm wearing a bathing suit, like a gentleman. <laughs> I took the kids Dude, to the Is it pool. laundry day? No, took the kids to the pool. Pool was closed. Still okay. wearing the suit. Yeah. When uh, you say you took the kids to the pool, that's you took a shit, right? No, <laughs> don't whisper that. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, it's and if I took the kids to the pool and the pool was closed, I'd be in some serious trouble. <laughs> uh, but I was in your case. Um, but let's just say get 20% off and free shipping with a code FANSIDED20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code FANSIDED20 at manscaped.com. For a clean trinity and beyond, your space balls. Well, thank you. All right, back to your audience questions since Ooh, I see those over. are piling up here. Actually, before we do, uh, what are you drinking tonight? Pete, yeah. what you got? Um, well, I'm still drinking uh, uh, cooler beers from my uh, friends that they, they left at my house from the bocce tournament. And uh, it's Hazo. Oh, it's Hazy a dogfish. Oh, it's a dogfish. Yeah. yeah, sure. 
Oh, Pete, when I came over for that, I left a can of dog food in a beer can there. So just let me know when you get to that. Well, I already drank it. So <laughs> delicious. <laughs> Good, man. Um, the Bashi tournament goes on. I'm drinking something um, that I don't quite understand. Either. Whoa. This is called a Tiki Moi from Seven Island Brewery. And it is a triple fruited kettle sour ale with blueberry, black curd, cranberry, and Tahitian vanilla. This and is that exactly sounds very the sort of thing Alex. You, yes, yes, you would it make very fun Alex. of me for. And let me just say, a friend brought this over to the house, and I have drank all the other beer in my fridge almost. And I was like, the other day, I was like, oh, I'll try one of these weird ones. And I actually really like it. It's very good. Ah. It's very light. So it's not at all sweet. And this thing's rocking a 6.5 uh, ABV. Woo, Woo. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, nice. I'm fired up. Welcome to the dark side, man. I am drinking The Truth, an Imperial IPA from Flying Dog. It's very nice. nice. That's Ooh, a Department, Department of Truth. Department of Truth. Department of Truth. Absolutely. We got a question here from Ju- for Justin. Excuse me, over on YouTube. This is from Scott Carpenter. Justin, what job were you doing that had some murder aspect to it? Great question. Um, I was working. This was. I may have told similar stories to this, but uh, for a while, I got some work as a live writer, essentially working on like live broadcasts, writing host dialogue. And so I got brought on to um, a show called, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was Ghost Hunters or Ghost, it was the one with Zach, um, is the name, the lead guy. Zach Morris? Nope. Uh, it's different Saved Zach. by the Bell? Yep. Nope. It's a ghost uh, version of that. Anyway, um, I went out, uh, it was, uh, we shot in Vegas and it was a live- Was it called Saved by the Hell? No good. This is all good stuff. Thank you. Um, the uh, we, he, this guy has a museum in Las Vegas of uh, haunted and cursed objects, and so it was his walk through uh, four hour four hour special of walking through um, his his haunted mansion, and there was a whole room dedicated to Ed Gein, and I was like, oh, oh this shit. is yeah, and the whole p- premise was of the skull this special, bowl there. Uh, there was some human remains that were there, and I was like, I can't believe this guy just has this shit. He bought it from some person related to that. Yeah. Anyway, he was opening the special was him opening something called the the Dybbuk box, yeah, I and I won't talk about. I that. won't spoil what happened. I but, thought we were all going to die that night. Yeah, <laughs> let me just say at the end of it that I've never believed in ghosts less than when I was working on this <sighs> ghost show. Wow. We got a question here from uh, Crowdcast. This is Edward Doherty. Which story from a real life business of comic book would make the best movie? And what would it be like? The Image Revolution as a heist movie, a Jerry Siegel Ooh. Liga drama, a Stan Lee or Jim Stranko swinging 60s period piece? What do you think? I mean, this goes back to what I thought when I was a kid, and it's probably not true, but a um, Ocean's Eleven of the image founders walking out of their big wow. uh, yeah. Marvel Marvel and DC jobs and just being like, we're going to do this our way. And then it working. That's a sort of low action action movie. <laughs> Uh, this is one, I mean, I'm stealing from a lot of other people, but there was a thing passed around. I don't even know if it was months ago, maybe it was years ago at this point, a Photoshop poster of Mark Marin in the Stan Lee story, which is like perfect casting. Yeah. I would love to see that and, you know, adapt Abe's book, like give it a little spin, give it a little darkness to it. That would be fun. I mean, that's a great, uh, sort of live action thing. Come combining like the true story of Stanley with a bunch of superhero stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pete. I got nothing. <laughs> nothing. 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 Come Jesus. on, Pete. Dig deep. How uh, many cooler beers have you had? Uh, too many. Too many. I don't know. What about like the new 52 story? Just the, they went rogue and they published 52 comics. Yeah. What about the sixth time they rebooted the multiverse? <laughs> <laughs> Want to hear how that conversation went down? <laughs> Uh, This is from Julian Lobato over on YouTube. Isaiah Rashad just released an album inspired by Tom King and Mitch Gerard's Mr. Miracle. Are there any artists you'd be interested to hear be inspired by comics? Which artist and which comic? That's a great question. Great question. So musical artist that you'd like to see do a concept album, potentially, if I was to interpret about a comic. You know what would be cool... 
I would love, I was actually about to make a joke about this, but I, I realized I would actually like to see this because I don't think he's done it. Uh, Gerard Way to do an Umbrella Academy album. Oh, that's Whoa. a great idea. Why hasn't he done that? I know, right? That's weird. Yeah. Mm. It is weird. It's time. Um, I'm trying to think of the right band to do like a homesick pilots. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Telling that story. Just mixing up the music oh, and the horror the and the haunted house. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe the right band is like, it's sort of like maybe middle early to middle period Radiohead doing that sort of maybe matches mm -hmm. the style uh, mm -hmm. or something or like very beginning REM, something like that. What was the band? There was a bunch of Marvel folks. Joe Casada was in it and they did gigs. At oh Comic yeah. And sometimes yeah, they could yeah. do a one more day. Kirby album. Crackle. Kirby Crackle. Yeah. <laughs> the Crackle. Yeah. Uh, well, were you trying to get Pete's goat on that? And then he was just, it was, it was, and then he came <laughs> back. <laughs> wow. But they knew, they knew. <laughs> yeah. This is from Jolene with DC seemingly bringing back a lot of nineties characters that disappeared. Who's someone that hasn't shown up yet that you want to see come back. Ooh, I mean, I don't know if I've talked about this a ton, but I loved the run of the Ray that happened back in the nineties, right around when Starman was happening. Actually, I think, it might have been Joe Casada on it, um, Ooh, and sad. I loved that. Uh, as the Rays are sort of like not being good at his life, very Spider Man esque problems, uh, having to take different jobs and trying to be a hero, trying to figure out why his life was the way it was. I love that run. I would like to see that back. We got a good suggestion here from the comments. Yeah. Aztec yeah. is a good one. Mm. Uh, I didn't read a lot of DC in the nineties. Like Whoa. I was much more focused on Marvel. So that's not really my thing. A more recent one. And they've tried this a couple of times, but Jaime Ray's blue beetle. Yeah. I'd love to see him back with an actually good title because that initial run was fantastic and nothing yeah. has quite matched up since. I mean, anything back zero hour was a great crossover and a great time i feel like at dc where the the creative swings they were taking had more like momentum behind them a book like primal force if you remember that with like red tornado and they were trying to oh, do wow, like, environmental yeah. things like any of that stuff that feels a little bit on the fringe it feels that feels like sort of the the grandfather of like justice league dark and books like that that have really carved out a niche but these books are doing it back when it wasn't cool and when they didn't need justice league in your title I got a question here on YouTube that's probably just for you and me, Justin, but I love this question. This is a good one. Worse animal attack, bear, Archie, or gator, Outer Banks? Clearly either are easy to bounce back from. <laughs> Great question. I got to say, both of those, I, I've never see, could imagine something like that more underplayed than the Archie bear attack. <laughs> Until... Outer Banks, one of the characters, if you haven't been watching it, again, highly recommend a great teen Goonies uh, kissing adventure. Um, that One of the characters get bit, gets bit by an alligator, and it is barely referenced and never talked about a second time. <laughs> wow. At least the, the Archie Bear attack they talk about all the time. This is like it never happened. The second season of Outer Banks, uh, to its credit, honestly, is like they watched all of Riverdale and said, how can we do that more efficiently? Yeah, <laughs> you know? those Riverdale folks taking all their time telling their stories. <laughs> Let's hustle through this I, shit. I don't think they do. No, but here's the thing about it. The very specific thing I'll call out about it, Outer Bag Season 2 is they basically do the Archie goes to prison plot, but in less than an episode. Like, yeah. He goes to wow. prison at the end of an episode, and by the end of the next episode, he's out of prison and everything's fine. Is versus... there still a prison fight club and stuff going on? I There's think so. Stuff There's stuff that happens, fighting, yeah. but you Is don't Mad really... Dog there? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, this is from Kevin. What's your favorite adaptation in comics or any medium of a story you loved from your childhood? Probably a reference to the Magic mm. Fish discussion, I believe. Mm. 
Childhood story. I'm trying to think what stories I liked as a uh, child. My favorite story as a kid was the story of Superman Red and Superman Blue, and they mm. did a really beautiful adaptation of that. Nice. Yes, very soon after mm -hmm. <laughs> you were reading it, probably. Yes. Um, I guess I really liked... Um, uh, Shakespeare's... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I was a big... Uh, Chronicles of Narnia was maybe my first big fantasy book that I read, and they haven't done that in comics, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Oh, are we talking about specifically comics adaptations? That's what I assumed. Uh, okay. Oh, in comics or any medium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't really say the Chronicles of Narnia adap movie adaptation was a fave. Um, by the way, that reminds me, remember when we had that guy on who was one of the producers of one of the Chronicles of Narnia movies? Oh, yeah, that's right. And that's it was like a crazy train wreck of a show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Luana Nana is calling out, what about the old BBC Narnia movie with the puppet animals? That's great. That's really good. Uh, I recently, well, a couple of months back now, but I read my son, The Lion, the Witch, of the Wardrobe is his uh, nighttime story. And first of all, great book. Very good. But there was no way of me reading that without doing the voices from the movie specifically because that mm. BBC Narnie movie is so part of my consciousness. Specifically, the beavers going, there's four sons of Adam and four sons huh. of Eve. That's just so you're, stuck in my head. That's the beaver voice from Lady and the Tramp. Let's be is honest. It? It's huh. a very similar, if not the same. They're all um, in the same me, universe. Uh, true. Uh, based on what you just said, Alex, do your kids sleep? <laughs> because you you described it as a nighttime story and not a bedtime story. Yeah. I'm curious what what work you have your I'll children you honestly, doing at night. I forgot the word bedtime story. Wow, <laughs> wow! Nice. Nice. Time for your nighttime story. Back to the mines. <laughs> My daughter used to say play. Uh, she was like, "Oh, I play these nighttime games." She came out and said that one time, and we were like, "What are you talking about?" And it's apparently just lying there and imagining things all night. It used to be that you would imagine she was part of Harry Potter, a mm. character called Penny Potter that was part of the adventures of Harry Potter. Wow. Uh, nice. Uh, but we've slowly, we've weeded that out of her. She doesn't have imagination anymore. So Smart. Prepare for the real world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got, uh, let's see, a bunch more questions here are coming in. This is from Sherlock over on YouTube. I would like to know your guys' opinion on the new X-Men run. I think we could actually split this into two parts huh. since I don't know which Sherlock is talking about because we have the Hickman X-Men run, but we also have what is coming up and what is happening now, which is not exactly post Hickman, but it's certainly the team that he set up taking the ball and running with it. Pete, I imagine your opinion is the same regardless. Yep. Great. Well, you don't even know what we're talking about. You can't hate pre hate it. Well, I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, what's great is, you know, people are talking about X-Men and very excited about X-Men. So that's great for X-Men. You know what I mean? But when you uh, take characters and then kind of completely change them and it just becomes a sitting around playing baseball for God knows how long and you're watching Island Hump, you know, who's winning at that point? You know what I mean? But The islands, I think. I guess so. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the important thing is that people are having fun with the comics. So if, if I'm the only one who's not having a good time, I can sit there and be like, hey, you know what? As long as you guys are having fun, that's what matters. I'm glad you're enjoying your X-Men. Wake me up when they're back to being the X-Men again. Did you hear the announcement today that there's going to be a House of X, Powers of Ten double style book? And this is not a joke. This sounds like I'm setting up a joke, but uh, called the the X Lives of Wolverine and the X Deaths of Wolverine. And they're about a future Wolverine and a past Wolverine meeting each other. What do you think about that, Pete? Well, that sounds intense, and I'm not sure how to process that information. That's kind of insane. It's too many Wolverines, T-O-O, definitely. Oh, yeah. I really like the current X-Men books, but there are too many of them right now. Mm. And I, I, I say that specifically, I mean, granted, we read a lot of books, so we're probably 
maybe not in a minority there, but sort of like a particular case. But certainly when I get to the X-Men books, like I've been reading the events and getting into the events and I've been enjoying them when I read them. But there's so many that it feels overwhelming to keep up with the universe at this point, other than those pinpoints in the middle here and there. See, I don't think there are too many books. I just think the intention of each books isn't clear all the time, each of the mm-hmm. books. Like, I feel like uh, we know what Marauders is doing, but they're also not really sticking to that mission. They're sort of going whatever in, in whatever part of the world those characters want to explore. And I think the books are good. Like, I like a lot of them. But if they had a little bit more of direction, like when we knew that the with X-Force was just a bunch of characters with knives stabbing people, we made fun of that, sure. But you knew what you were getting when you read that book, and it was good. Um, yep. So I just think it needs a little bit more like outward focus, I think would help to really differentiate. And I do think there are books that are doing that. Like X core is very clearly about the business side way of X is about exploring the religion. So they're doing a good job of exploring these different aspects of the world. But again, it gets to a place where it just feels a little overwhelming. And I know this can happen because I know it's a company and they need to put out a certain amount of books. So they took a risk on this anyway, but just thinking back to the conversation around House of X and Powers of Ten, it felt electric to be reading the book at that point because it was so focused on this game-changing story. You can't do that every time out of the gate. That's just not possible. It's corporate comics, and that's fine, and I get it. Um, You know, we had... Jordan D. White, editor of the books, back on the show, back when those were launching, and he was talking about how terrified they were about, like, oh, my God, we can't publish one book a week, we're going to go bankrupt if we do that. Like, he didn't use those yeah. words, but that was essentially the implication. So I get why they have all of these books. But as a reader who has a limited amount of time to read comics, watch TV shows, take care of my children, other things in my life, yeah. do my job. It, read my children, it, nighttime stories. Yes, nighttime books, night books, if you will. It's mm. it's a, you have to make choices at a certain point. And it, it doesn't feel quite as necessary to me to read 10 X-Men books as it does one a week. I, uh, my take very similar, like, um, and this is probably going to be an unpopular way of phrasing it, but it's the difference Mm. to me between like the open world Zelda games where you're sort of like, here you go, find a (laughs) horse maybe. (laughs) And, (laughs) and play and playing the more like dungeon based classic Zelda games. Um, and the sort of the new reboots of those, I find myself gravitating toward the the more dungeon based one because I'm like, I see what I'm doing. I'm going here, here, and here. And that's what I want in my time when I'm not like working or taking care of children. I want some like hard direction. Um, and with the open world, I'm like, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess I'll go find the pick some turnips for a while. And it's like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I, that just feels like a little bit of what the X-Men world is right now. I think that, that is a really good metaphor because that is what they're doing, right? They're sort of just living in this world for a while. And that was our trepidation, or at least that was my trepidation with the announcement that Hickman was allowing them to sit in this phase one, this first act of the comic books for a while longer is like, you're just sort of wandering around at a certain point. You lose that forward momentum and that's a bit of a bummer. But at the same time, I think the big takeaway here is they're still good like they're and they are good and i do like a lot of them and the stories have a lot of ideas in them i just wish that there was one book that was pushing the main story forward so we could really know we could really hook into that as the sort of the main and it sounds like that's what inferno is going to be so we'll see what happens with that and we'll see where the world is left after inferno but uh, they're gonna burn it to the ground is what they they said might be a disco inferno oh there you go that'd be fun this is from Josh. In honor of the various fantasy football drafts happening all across the country, but modified as it makes no sense to draft comic book characters for a fantasy football draft, if you were team captains for the X-Men baseball games, who would be your first pick? Uh, great question. Wow. Hmm. Uh, and let's remember. First pick. No no powers. This what? Is an, Ooh. Uh, the, the baseball game is is traditionally no powers because it always ended with somebody using their powers and then being like, "Well, now the ball's shredded into three pieces, Wolverine." <laughs> I do whatever. It was probably Cyclops who would just laser eye the ball, shredded into three pieces with his laser claws. Yeah, yeah, and then he okay. would bl- blame Wolverine. Um, but I mean, I think no, I don't know. The I'm line gonna... of powers uh, is does Wolverine need to leave his skeleton behind? 
Yeah, that's why he was always laying in the outfield being like, <laughs> help. <laughs> they use him as third base, I think. Yeah. He's the best he is at what he does. And oh, what he come does on. Is- come on. <laughs> Big third base. Um, no. What do you think? First pick. Uh, uh, hmm. The powers thing threw me for a little loop because I was going to say Storm first because it feels like she could use her wind powers to you know, give it a little bit of a She lift. could end the game at any time. Yeah. But she might still be good. I feel like Storm yeah. could probably <laughs> knock it out of the park, honestly. Wow. Uh, nice. Um, I uh, I feel like um, in an era of uh, Moneyball, you really want someone like Cypher to really figure out the ins and outs here and um, oh, yeah. it's sort of win the Cypher. game by speaking the language of baseball. Oh, Jesus. wow. He's just having everybody walk. He's like, they have to walk them. Yeah, walk them. Like, yeah, walk. Walk. This is no fun. Yeah. Pete? Uh, I got to go with Beast, you know. Uh, powers aside or whatever, that guy is coordinated. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. you know, that's what you need in baseball. On a hot day, standing in, sitting in the bullpen with that sweaty mess? I don't think so. <laughs> hey, man, <laughs> no. he can even bat with his feet. You know, I mean, the guy's guy's talented. Yeah, why do, why do you need that? Fun. Use your hands. That's the way the game is meant to be played. <laughs> this, isn't a with trick. Your feet. this isn't a circus. You take this the game is... seriously. From Nelson Martinez over on YouTube. For Alex, I just read Shadow and Bone and watched it all on Netflix. Which book should I read next? Second volume of Shadow and Bone or the first book in the Six of Crows duology? The answer to that pretty definitively is the second book in the Shadow and Bone trilogy. Then read the third one. Then read Six of Crows because they actually do go in release order and pick up on plot points for the previous ones, even though they're separate stories. So there you Alex, go. are you you've become a shadow and bone guy? I've yeah. noticed this on your Twitter, and you sort of hot. You sort of like mix it up with a bunch of other tweets, but mm-hmm. the tweets you want to be tweeting tweet, are the shadow. Every other tweet is a shadow and bone. The series is real good. I that's what you say when someone's like, "What is this?" And they're like, "The series is real good." Oh, uh, <laughs> hi, boys. <laughs> I'm just a regular guy, not a shadow and bone guy. I'm not a Molina shipper. I don't know what you're talking about. It's cool. It's cool. Got a couple of other questions here over on YouTube from Stanley. Are there any comic characters you like so much that you try to emulate their personality? Ooh, I mean, wow. easy answer for Pete. <laughs> yeah. uh, Eddie Gein, right, Pete? What the fuck, man? <laughs> you were saying earlier that you respect him. What? Or whatever. You, I don't know. You use some positive no, adjective. No, I did not. Yeah, he just said the story was magical. I was <laughs> talking right. about, magical was, rump. you know, uh, Eric, uh, who was uh, yes. doing an amazing job in the book. That wasn't... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I mean, I this isn't a current thing that uh, I do, but it may have been formative in my personality. I really liked Speedball back in the day when I was a kid. <laughs> and I liked it because he bounced around and he was fun. He was fun. <laughs> I mean, uh, the the real answer for me is I learned a lot um, uh, growing up uh, uh, from different people. You know what I mean? Like, what I really liked uh, about Wolverine was the fact that uh, he didn't let his size uh, get in the way of anything. You know what I mean? Um, Hulk found a way to uh, work with his anger. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of, like, cool things you can kind of take away from uh, watching other people go through the motions. And that, that was pretty huge for me. I mean, I, yeah, I agree with that. I think it's more general lessons that you take away from reading comic books and hopefully interpreting them the right way. Certainly thinking about Spider-Man and always fighting for what is right, oh, <laughs> fighting for what's right and just really drilling down on that and doing right by other people and thinking about other people first is always important. Even Batman, just the idea that like, I mean, that sounds silly because he does so much like kicking the shit out of people, but like solving mysteries, being honorable and not taking things too far, like always knowing what that line is. That's something that I think certainly I took away from Batman in a certain way, or when I think about it, I am surprised how much, that I took away from reading Batman comics mm. and also Superman, uh, same thing, just Superman always doing the right thing, no matter what, like no matter how hard it is really, really trying to do the right thing 
in every single circumstance. Not like a it's, big DC guy though over there. Or like Green Lantern. I think like I, I took one of my big lessons was making energy constructs with my mind. That's something that I really uh, learned that is, over time. That was important through the, the power of my will. Or the Flash running really fast. That was another lesson that I learned. Uh, Wonder Woman yeah. having a lasso. Well, I the problem is that I got myself into is I would assume everybody was watching the same shows, taking away the lessons. Like mm -hmm. I got really upset at my bullies uh, for, and, you know, who are beating me up and taking my lunch money. Like, didn't we all watch GI Joe? Didn't we all learn that this isn't the answer everybody, but apparently not. Mm. Yeah. You were just waiting for the part where a Joe walks up where um, snow plow or uh, a dance break or umbrella <laughs> Bar walks up. barbecue to my barbecue. I don't know. Uh, is that a and, real like, one? Is yeah. Really got barbecue? Yeah. What does he do? Invite people over to his backyard? Is, you know. He is a flamethrower? He's missing the point of a barbecue, if that's what his focus <laughs> is. Um, but you were just waiting for the part where the bullies were attacking you. You were like, any minute, one of the Joes is going to be here. <laughs> and those fuckers never came. Never came. They betrayed you. Here's a question from Jack Rudy. What is the sleeper comic of 2021 so far? Ooh. Great. That is a tough answer. There's so many great comics so far. I have an answer, and this is um, some uh, future recency bias, bias I'm going to throw here. Classic Justin move. The Many Deaths of Layla uh, Star. 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 So good. Truly yeah. one of my favorite comics I've read in a long time. Uh, I think it, it wraps up. Is the last issue come out tomorrow? Yeah. I can't wait to read it. It is so good. I mean, you called it out earlier, but I'd say Homesick Pilots. I don't know how that's been selling. No, they're good ones. That book is so creative and so good, and I think people are just going to catch on to it later, how awesome it is. Pete, what about you? Uh, I'm trying not to be so... what came out recently but echo lands was really impressive i'm very excited yeah. about that um i'm trying to uh go back a little bit <sighs> i also think I, I mean i don't know if i necessarily stand by this but these books are really interesting and i'm glad marvel is putting them out the demon days books that they're doing oh yeah really gorgeous and I don't think they're getting enough attention necessarily. At least I don't see them getting attention. But they're really, really beautiful. And I think it's also laudable that Marvel is putting out these books that are in a different universe, have a very different look, when it feels like a lot of Marvel stuff has become generic is the wrong word, but genericized in terms of across the line versus a lot of DC books are really trying things artistically nowadays. But, you know, uh, I think that's... That's a good call. Um, I want to throw it out to Ha Ha as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and one uh, one more that we talk about that is, I don't know if it's a, a sleeper, but um, Black Hammer Visions, I think, is mm. a book that we really love. And it's telling just great superhero uh, stories, um, even though they're all set using these the Black Hammer characters. They really are just like universal superhero stories. Yeah. Once Let's... in future, I just got to say it. I always say it, but come on. Come on. Come on. Last question here. This is from Luana Nana. How cuddly was the last cat you cuddled with? Was it a good cat cuddling experience? Don't. Don't. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> what? Pete, that's an uh, honest this, question from a fan. From a listener slash viewer of the show. It seems unrelated <laughs> to anything that's going on domestically in your house. Pete. Yeah. <laughs> you want to take this one first? Sure, yes. Uh, yeah, do you want to feel this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so my... the question was how... <laughs> Luana <laughs> Nana <laughs> commenting immediately, don't suck the fun. Yeah, Fair take, point. Take Pete, the bait. It, cuddle uh, on. Well, cats, uh, you know, normally a little standoffish. And finally, after all this time with uh, my cat, uh, you know, Luana... Uh, busted me and uh, uh, the cat cuddling. So it was a real nice moment today on the couch that I had. So to, to walk us through this real quick. What do you mean by a cuddle? Like, is this like a full purr? Who's purr, who purring first? You or the cat? Uh, uh, are you <laughs> are you are you curled up next to each other? Well, I, I can tell this because, you know, I see my girlfriend and the cat's like lying right next to her. And the cat usually doesn't yeah. get that close to me. But it finally happened today. So it was a big deal in our household. 
Wow. After all these years of feeding and taking care of this cat, finally uh, I got a little little cuddle time. It was adorable. Oh, that's that's very nice. Yeah, my kids, uh, they looked at me today too, and it was really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Did they cuddle with you? Did you have a little couch time? No, they did just walk here uh, into the kitchen, open the fridge, and say, we're hungry. <laughs> like, it's bedtime. It's bedtime. And I'm not serving a meal, another meal. <laughs> oh, sounds like a mini Justin to me. Yeah. All right. That is it for your audience questions. Yeah. And now it's time for trivia. And for that, we're going to turn it over to Pete LePay. Yeah. Or are we? I mean, we are, right. but we're going to do things a little bit differently today. Right. Uh, now, normally what we do here is we give away a gift card to Midtown Comics to a lucky listener. This week, we're going to do it a little differently, uh, specifically because, and I'm sure most of you know this, but I'm going to turn down this music because this is not appropriate for what I'm about to say. Uh, <laughs> we have a bunch of awesome folks, uh, specifically in our Patreon Slack, but I assume more people listening out there in the listening audience who have been very, very negatively affected by Hurricane Ida out in Louisiana and the surrounding areas. So what we're going to do this week, instead of giving away a gift card to Midtown Comics, is Pete is going to challenge me and Justin to trivia, and then we're going to That's give right. away the money, not uh, to a Midtown Comics gift card for us, but instead we're going to donate to the World Central Kitchen to help provide meals for those impacted Great. by Hurricane Ida. So the way this will work is Pete's going to ask the questions. If Justin and I win, we're going to donate the money. If we lose, they don't get any money. So here yeah, we go. So, yeah, right? no, no hints. It's all on the line. Yeah, it's all, it's on, the all on the line. It's all on the line. And all for any of you listening live here, I will drop the link to donate if you would also like to support because it's a very worthy cause. But Pete, take it away with some questions. All right. Today's trivia is on topical comic news and a small nod to Ed, a small nod to Ed Asner. Please listen to all three options before making your selection. Okay, guys? Here we All go. Right. Go I can't believe I'm the star of trivia right now. This is so exciting. <laughs> you are, JT says. Here we go. Question number one. Whom is getting meta in an Ooh. anti-corporate capitalism comic? Is it A, Rick and Morty, B, Wonder Woman, or C, Betty White? So is it A, Rick and Morty, or is it B, Wonder Woman? Oh, you told us you weren't going to give... Any hints? I was going to go for Betty White, but I guess I won't now. Yeah, Just honestly, I don't think he gave a hint uh, that one. <laughs> no, he told me before the show he was actually going to make it hard on us because he uh, is angry at New Orleans. That doesn't respect no, us. No. <laughs> is on. The, uh, I mean, my instinct says Rick and Morty because they're usually more meta than Wonder Woman. Uh, so I'm going to go with A. Justin, you um, in agreement? I will second that answer and go. With that a. is correct. All right. Woo. Rick oh, it feels Morty. good. It feels so good to get an right. answer right. Here we go. Question number two. What legendary writer is coming back for the 90s inspired Wolverine X-Men Legends number seven? Is it A, Larry Hama, B, Greg Pak, or C, Morgan Freeman? So is it A again? Well, this is tough because or I is used it to... B? love Morgan Freeman's run back in the day. Well, he that's did he's not, amazing job. Not a real option here. I think he created Wolverine, right? On the <laughs> Cobra, no, writing no, He was the Cobra. artist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, given that Greg Pak wasn't really working back then, on, and Pete loves Larry Hama, I'm going to go with Larry Hama. Just I don't know if you could read into the Pete on this one, do you think? Because uh, Pete usually is very objective when it comes to because he's a journalist. Um, it nope. would be completely Never objective. To be. Uh, we are journalists. You've gotten no, the press not. pass many times in your life, and you wore a little hat with the word press stuck in it. Like a real... I'm not a news. And there was that time we were at a, a Comic-Con panel, and you ran to the phone booth before anybody else because you had to get a scoop to your editor. You, and true. you did. Your editor was Alex at the time, I believe. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, wow, great turned... scoop. 300 great words scoop. dictated I, to me. I was standing next to you when you heard that. Uh, I think Ju A. A is correct. Oh, whew. Went back to back A's to try to throw you guys off, but no. Right, I will go. not be fooled. Here we go. Last one. What is the name? Hey, 50 bucks says it's A. Oh, <laughs> man. You don't know that. You don't know that. 
<laughs> I don't. I okay. just said it. Don't you try to switch them now. Oh, I really want to. All right, here we go. What is the name of the cool werewolf graphic novel out soon? Is it A, Artie and the Wolf Moon, B, Barty Not So Tardy, or is it C, Christian Slater? Oh, boy. Huh. Well, we ran out of music, so <laughs> that happened. That, that did happen. Christian Slater. I mean, I, I I know that the answer is Artie and the Wolf Moon, but I kind of want to say the second one. That sounds ridiculous. <laughs> what was it? Bard Marty the One Man Party. <laughs> Barty not so tardy. Barty not so tardy. Uh, well, I'm gonna go with what I called uh, earlier, and um, Pete has to give me fifty bucks because it's a. That is correct. It is A. Yeah. Ooh. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. We will take that money, Pete, and we will donate it That's awesome. directly That's to the World Central Kitchen instead. Again, if you want to help provide meals for those impacted by Hurricane Ida, that's a great place to donate that money. And folks... Uh, real quick, uh, Jose Andres, uh, his organization is World Central Kitchen. That guy is an absolute hero going everywhere in the world that there is uh, like fragile um, food systems and just helping people out in a way that is it's unbelievable. If you don't know anything about him, check him out. He's so interesting and his organization is so good. Uh, so I will... Um, I'm going to throw the 50 bucks I just won from Pete into the pot as well. Nice. Uh, I just wanted to point out Kevin is correct. Of course, we're talking about the 1998 hit Hard Rain. Uh, what Ed Asner would want to be known for? Hey, you know. I mean, Hard Rain has one of my favorite lines of all time. I've only seen the trailer, but... What? They're, they're robbing... The whole thing is like they're robbing something in the middle of a flood, right? Why did you choose hard raid right <laughs> now? Jesus Christ. A little too... A little What's too wrong on with nose. you? Yes, it's too on the nose. Oh, my God. Oh, I didn't God, even know Pete. that. I liked how it just occurred to you. Uh, really uh, yeah, you really got me there. Yeah. Sorry. Jesus Christ, Pete. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Let's move on and talk about... The fact that there are new comics coming out this week that we're very excited about. That we're really yeah, we are. To. Pete, what are you looking forward to? I, I tell you what, I'm I'm excited for Undiscovered Country number 15. Um, really excited about this issue. Uh, I feel like this book does this amazing job of walking this amazing creative adventure uh, and giving us little pieces of information along the way, like each kind of stage has been its own thing. But I'm really appreciating what's happening, uh, especially in this issue and, and moving forward. The cover of this issue looks like it's right out of Homesick Pilots to keep there talking about that. Yeah. Justin, what are you looking forward to? I mean, I'd be hard. Uh, it'd be hard for me not to choose the many hard deaths of uh, Layla Star. Uh, nope. Um, because uh, I really do think that is a fantastic comic. Um, and the, like I said, the last issue is coming out tomorrow. Very excited to read that comic and hear how one of the most imaginative and beautiful poetic <laughs> books will come to an end. Mm. I'm looking forward to the beauty, all good things coming from Image ah. Comics. This is one yes. of my absolute favorite titles that, to be honest, I completely forgot about. Like, I completely forgot it existed. It is not coming out forever. And this is the final issue of the book, at least for now, that they're releasing. So seeing that in the stack was such a pleasant surprise. I was so happy to see this book back because it's awesome. If you've never read it, it's about a world where there is a sexually transmitted disease that makes people young and beautiful. Uh, and it starts there, but really spins out into a ton of different directions. There's conspiracy theory tales. There's crime tales. There's just simple tales of people being in love and falling out of love. So creative, so interesting. So very excited to see it back. And folks, that is it for this week's show. A couple of things to plug and check out. First of all, thank you to our guests. Thank you to Trung Lee Nguyen. Uh, you should check out the Magic Fish. You really from should. Penguin Random House. It's very cool. Also, did you hear what Eddie Gein done oh, from man. Eric Powell? That's out from Albatross. So scary. Right now. Definitely check that out. Really Next cool, week though. on the show, we're going to have uh, two more great guests. Dave Scheidt and Miranda Harmon are going to be here to talk about the book Mayor Good Boy. It is about a dog that gets arrested, uh, not arrested, uh, elected <laughs> mayor yeah. for Our horrible elected, crimes, elected, terrible, terrible, it's, it's, it's disgusting. It's the Ed Gein of dogs. Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> we got a whole theme going on there. So check that out. A couple of things to plug on our end. Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast, is rolling out with new episodes every Wednesday for What It. If also Riverdale After Dark, our Riverdale podcast, Wednesdays after that show. Oh, man. Star Guys, our Star Riverdale. Girl podcast, Tuesday after that show. Patreon.com slash comic book club to support this show and all the shows that we do. iTunes, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or in the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow at Comic Book Live on Twitter, Comic Book Club Live on Instagram, Comic Book Club Live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next week, good night. Take care of yourself. Good night. Hope you get power. Good night.